Anywho, so we're going to wrap this section up. We'll move into the like the ortho pain management section. We should be able to finish on time, and then um, the afternoon session tomorrow should just be a review at that point. So that should be um, good. So I, I told you I'd get through it all, and we probably will still. Um, so talking about osteoporosis, osteomalacia, we know this is sort of uh, you know a disorder of impaired bone density, right? Um, we know that they're compromising the bone structure; it's getting more brittle, and that obviously leads to what? Fractures, right? So what kind of fractures are these patients usually like at risk for? Hip fractures, vertebral, wrist, yeah, so all kinds of fractures, right? And so why do we why do we care about fractures? So what people break bones all the time. Yeah. Yeah, these are elderly patients, so they kinda hit a kind of a spiral once they start to have some of these fractures. That's very debilitating. Oftentimes they lose a lot of function and it can lead to chronic pain issues, all kinds of problems that, that happen here. Um, and so that's, that's what we're going to try to prevent by, by treating this. But there's certainly medications we want to focus on in terms of things that can cause osteoporosis, things that will help to um, kind of expedite the demineralization of the bone. Uh, and so, for instance, we have things like aromatase inhibitors, which we'll talk more about when we get to the OB-GYN section later on. But anyone know what aromatase does? If I've mentioned it before. Good, yeah, it converts testosterone over to estrogen. So why do you think an aromatase inhibitor would speed up the demineralization of the bone? Well, if I'm producing less estrogen, more of it's being stuck in the testosterone form, what do you think it does to the bone? It kind of speeds up osteoclast activity, right? That's one of the things we see when patients hit menopause and they're stopping, uh, or their production of estrogen goes down pretty significantly, osteoporosis happens. So we can induce that with medications too, right? Um, different ways we can do that. So glucocorticoids, we know long term, that can also lead to issues of osteoporosis. It can kind of hasten that along, which is a problem. We just talked about rheumatoid arthritis. Um, what do you think proton pump inhibitors could do this too? Remember, calcium is more soluble in acidic pHs, so if I'm raising the pH of the GI tract, that's going to lead calcium to be less absorbable. And this is one of those things where you see elderly patients, we always tell them, make sure you drink your milk, make sure you get lots of calcium, vitamin D, mainly because we worry about osteoporosis, right? And so if they're getting proton pump inhibitors, calcium is less soluble, then it just stays in the GI tract, right? So um, a lot of different things here, just a few that I kind of highlighted as being some of the, the more kind of high risk ones, things that patients may be commonly on or things that can really um, kind of knock them from a loop from that standpoint. But even things like Lasix, right? Lasix, um, why would that hasten it? If I'm giving a loop diuretic, what happens to calcium excretion in the urine? It's going to go up, right? So again, all these things kind of make sense if you know the mechanisms. You know you're kind of um, messing up or kind of messing around with, with calcium homeostasis. You can certainly see how this can, can be an issue, right? Um, so remember, there's a balance between the osteoclast and the osteoblast, right? So osteoblasts are normally laying down new bone. Osteoclasts are taking it back up. And we know that lots of different hormones can affect this, right? So estrogen and testosterone tend to have more of a pro sort of osteoblast sort of effect. It helps to lay down more bone. Estrogen is going to be much stronger in this respect than testosterone will. Uh, what does PTH do? Yeah, so it's going to be causing the osteoclast to work stronger or to work more uh, fervently so that way they can actually uh, liberate a lot of that calcium, that phosphate from the bone because PTH is just what? What's the name for it? Parathyroid hormone, right? And that when does that get released? What's the stimulus for that? Low serum calcium is absolutely right. Actually, vitamin D is going to play a big role with that as well. So if you have low serum calcium levels, parathyroid say, hey, we need more calcium. Let's get it from the bone because that's where the majority of it's going to be stored at, right? Um, so anyway, so again, we have to manage this balance here. We're going to see this is also a really big issue, um, especially with like kidney patients, patients with chronic kidney disease. They're going to have a really big issue, which we'll talk about at a later time as well. Um, and, and again, it's like this renal osteodystrophy that we'll talk about. But um, how do we regulate our calcium? So we can, you know, certainly take it up from the bone. Um, what are some other ways we can regulate our calcium levels? So it could be on the absorption side of things, right? So how do we absorb more calcium from the GI tract? Mm -hmm. Things like vitamin D help out a lot with that, right? So vitamin D is going to be playing a big role. We'll talk about vitamin D homeostasis as well in just a few minutes. Um, also, you have to think about how we're excreting it in the kidneys, okay? So again, there's a kind of a delicate balance where we're going to be trying to make sure that we're holding on to enough in the kidneys, we're not getting rid of too much. We're going to try to make sure we're absorbing the right amount from the GI tract. And then hopefully, if that's imbalanced, then you shouldn't need to take a whole lot of it out of the bone, right? So making sure on the supply side and on the excretion side, things are kind of under control from that standpoint, right? Um, 
As I mentioned, you know, estrogen deficiency certainly is going to be increasing the osteoclast activity, which is why we end up seeing a lot of the patients who are postmenopausal, they tend to have osteoporosis as a problem, uh, as a result of that, right? So um, obviously prevention is going to be the biggest thing. If you can try to keep the bones strong and healthy from the start, then you prevent a lot of these fractures from, from happening here, right? Um, and once a fracture does occur, then obviously we want to try to help get them back as much function as they can, try to prevent further falls and fractures. And keep in mind, you know, um, you can really set these patients up for, for you know, big issues because you think about the fact that they have brittle bones and what if we put them on a medication, say for instance, we put them on Lasix and have to get up in the middle of the night to go urinate, you know, what can likely happen? They can fall, right? We put them on new antihypertensive and they get orthostatic hypotension from that, right? So you can see how these can kind of compound on one another to lead to some of these fractures occurring there, right? CNS medications are going to depress the mental status, you know, antihypertensive. I mean, there's a whole list of things. And have you heard of the, the beers list before? It's not what you get at the restaurant, but um, it's basically a list of medications that are really dangerous in elderly patients and things you can do to try to get around that. So we'll talk much more about that in the Jerry section um, later on. Anyway, so where are patients mostly getting their calcium from? Certainly uh, their diet should be a big uh, source of that. We're going to see in terms of exogenous supplementation, calcium carbonate uh, or Tums is usually the most common thing there. And we talked about that as this use for um, antacid purposes, but a lot of older patients will be taking this extra anyway. Um, remember that constipation is going to be a big side effect from this. Anytime you're giving calcium, constipation is going to be an issue, so if you're throwing other medications um, along with that. Remember, it can bind to other stuff, so you want to make sure you're separating out those medications. If they're on Cipro, Zape, or UTI, they need to separate it out from their calcium, because otherwise it's just going to bind it up and it's not going to work all that well. We'll talk about the bisphosphonates in a little bit. This is our, one of our main medications we're going to use for, for this therapy here. Um, now, vitamin D is interesting because the vitamin D that we normally get from our diet or from exogenous supplementation, anyone know what the forms those come in? There's D2 and there's D3. What are the other names for that? Ergo and cholecalciferol, right? So are those the active form of vitamin D? It is not. Neither of them are the active form of vitamin D, okay? How about when you're sitting next to the window here and you're getting some sunlight? Is that the activated form either? Not yet, right? So it has to go through some activation steps. I've always wanted to do an experiment uh, where I like tested the vitamin D levels of like people on this side of the room versus that side of the room. Because you're in here eight hours a day, so chronically, is this side of the room benefiting from extra vitamin D because they get some sunlight? Who can say, right? But. Um, where does vitamin D get activated? Where else? It's a two-step process, right? So it has to undergo this hydroxylation step in both the liver and then it goes down to the kidneys, right? So if you have a patient with dysfunction in either one of those organs, you can find that vitamin D activation is going to be impaired, right? So normally through diet or through exogenous supplementation, we get our ergo or cholecalciferol. Once it gets hydroxylated once in the liver, it's called uh, calcifidiol. And then once it gets down into the kidneys, it turns into calcitriol, okay? And again, you're going to see with patients who have chronic kidney disease, they're not able to convert this over very well, which can help to worsen the osteoporosis, right? Because you're going to see that they can't regulate intake of calcium because their vitamin D is not getting activated. Is there any way to get around this? I can give the active form, yeah. So I can actually supplement, I can just give patients calcitriol, right? That way I don't have to worry about the organ function and how that's going to be playing a role. And again, what kind of patients are likely to have their liver or their kidneys fail? Elderly patients, right? So you have to kind of consider the sort of thing. But we have kids too. We have, you know, um, you know, lupus or other kind of like, you know, uh, autoimmune conditions where their kidneys are taking a hit. And we'll have to give them calcitriol because they can't uh, form the vitamin D themselves, the activated form. So anyway, so we're going to find that um, a lot of times medications is going to be needed in addition to the, you know, the non-pharmacologic sort of therapies here. And certainly um, most of the time, especially women as they get older than 50, this is where we're going to start thinking about the meds having these risks over time, right? So you start to look at the, the percentage risk based off their bone mineral density scans and things like that to see what's the likelihood of them, of them having a fracture within, say, 10 years or something. And based off that risk, um, then you'll decide kind of how you're going to modify your, your pharmacologic therapy here, as we'll see. So um, in terms of that, we call that anti-resorptive therapy, right? So we're trying to prevent resorption of calcium from the bone. We like it to, for it to stay there. Anyone know what other metal likes to hang out in the bone? Like maybe like a metal we shouldn't have in our bodies? Hmm? Say it again? Say it louder? Mm. So um, actually, 
I'm trying to lead you into a, a point, but uh, tangent. But basically, lead likes to stay in the bone, right? Again, what's a normal lead level? Anyone know? Zero. Right? You shouldn't have lead in the body, right? So neurotoxin. Um, but it's interesting. You can have, especially like kids who have, say, for instance, um, and actually lead and calcium look just like one another to the body because they have the same uh, valent charge, and, and the body can't tell the difference between the two. So if you have kids who are actually in a low calcium, low vitamin D sort of state, like so, say you have like a kid in the inner city and they're not getting a good diet and um, all of that, they can actually end up absorbing more lead, right? Because you find lead in like a lot of old buildings and things like that. And actually, what you'll find in the bones, you can actually X-ray them and get they get lead lines that will happen uh, that will occur there because the body is trying to put anything that looks like calcium into the bones. Lead will do that, right? So they can actually get these little um, uh, radio opaque lines in the bone that will signify lead was there. But anyway, um, so some things that would be in, our, in terms of our anti-absorptive therapy, we'll have calcium and vitamin D, pretty straightforward. We'll talk about our bisphosphonates, talk about some estrogen uh, agonists and antagonists. Anyone know what the term CERM means? Yeah, so it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Um, talk about calcitonin, denosumab, estrogen, and then testosterone at the end here. So in terms of the bisphosphonates, this is going to be kind of your gold standard thing to do after patients have been on calcium and vitamin D. If those are not uh, sufficient in and of themselves, this is where we'll rely on our bisphosphonates. And so we have a couple here. We have alendronate, ibandronate, and risendronate. Those are the most common sort of oral agents you're going to find there. And then we actually have one called zoledronic acid that's IV only. You don't know how often you have to give zoledronic acid? actually just one time a year, which is kind of nice. So these drugs actually have a pretty long half-life, as we'll see, and we'll look at the uh, reasons why you may want to give the IV formulation one time a year versus something you may give more chronically orally. Um, basically what they do is they mimic this product called pyrophosphate, and it actually is a natural endogenous product that helps to prevent bone resorption in and of itself. So you'll find that osteoclasts will be less active, they're getting less mature, um, and their actual lifespan will go down when you introduce these bisphosphonates here. So in terms of their kinetics, they have terrible bioavailability. And so administration and education on that is going to be like super important for these patients because if they don't take it correctly, they're not going to absorb very much of it and it's not going to work very well. Um, so anytime they're taking with any kind of concomitant food or beverages, their coffee, their grapefruit juice, whatever in the morning, um, it's going to prevent them from absorb, uh, absorbing it, right? Um, basically what we need to do is to make sure they're taking it by itself with just a glass of water and kind of that's it, okay? Um, even though they have a really long half-life, right? They can biologically they can get once they're stuck in the bone, they're kind of there for a really long time. So like 10 years, they can stick around for it. But um, again, getting the absorption of it is actually what the the problem is there from that standpoint. Um, one of the other big things you'll find is that the bisphosphonates also like to lodge themselves in the esophagus occasionally. So you have to make sure that patients don't go um, say wake up, take their bisphosphonate, and go lay back down for a little bit. They need to stay upright for at least 30 minutes. Okay, and actually we've seen things like esophageal perforations happen. Uh, esophageal erosions and whatnot happen uh, over time just because patients are not um, getting them actually down into the GI tract, right, or into the stomach. Um, so you will see a lot of GI complaints because of issues like that, especially that esophagitis that can occur there. Um, and then another interesting sort of thing that you have to watch out for as well is you can actually get this osteonecrosis of the jaw, which can actually lead to the jaw kind of basically like rotting out essentially. Um, so that's one thing you would look at for more chronic sort of therapy. You'd look at that over the long term. Um, as I mentioned, you know, just take it, the tablets, so just with, you know, say six to eight ounces of water, no other liquids or anything, because that will impair its absorption there. Um, you at least want to take it 30 minutes before consuming anything else. That will allow it to have as good a bioavailability as, as you can muster there. Um, as I mentioned, dosing is usually based on the product. Some of them are going to be weekly, some can be monthly, or as I mentioned, the zoledronic acid. If you have a patient who you're worried about absorbing it very well, or if they are not really compliant with it, you can just have them come in, get their one-time yearly infusion, and then they're kind of good to go for, for that whole year. Um, so again, it's because when you give something IV, what's the bioavailability? 100% at that point, right? So I don't have to worry about them absorbing anything from the GI tract at that point. And then, like I said, the half-life is so long that you only have to do it one time a year. So those are kind of the, the gold standard after calcium and, and vitamin D. Um, denosumab or prolia would be something you do, say, as a secondary agent if, say, your bisphosphonates are working here. Um, we know it's a monoclonal antibody, and actually it's something that binds to this wrinkle protein. Um, basically, it is, there's a rank receptor here, and normally when it binds to it, it will stimulate some of these osteoclast precursor cells, so it kind of stimulates some maturation and replication of those osteoclasts there. If by inhibiting that, because you have the antibody that will go and bind up that wrinkle protein, you'll basically prevent the osteoclast from achieving maturation there, right? Um, being a monoclonal antibody, how do we have to give it? 
parenterally, right? So sub Q in this case here. Um, and this one's actually dosed just every six months. So again, very infrequent sort of dosing, pretty long half-life, which we saw with a lot of the monoclonal antibodies, you know, you know Remicade you may only have to give like every two months in some cases, right? Um, in terms here, what you're going to see is, is in terms of side effects, um, obviously, one of the important things, I mean, osteoclasts are good for us. Like, you know, we need to constantly be taking up and putting down new bone, right, to recycle and make it stronger. So um, you will suppress that by giving something like denosumab. Um, clinically, what the impact of that's going to be, who can really say, but that's um, one of the things they'll, they'll kind of know with it. So um, it may have some effects on, on bone strength over the long term because of that. Um, other issues there may be some local dermatologic reaction. That's probably the most common thing you'll probably run into. Um, we will talk about this in ob -GYN. I'm not going to make questions specific to this on, on the test, but just know that we'll just talk about our mixed estrogen um, receptor antagonist. Um, so essentially what we can do, um, just real briefly, when I give estrogen to patients, are they, you know, to the kind of replace what they were normally producing? Are there any big problems with that? Are there any like issues that can come about? So cancer is a risk, right? So if I'm giving estrogens, I can cause um, you know, like cervical cancer, it can cause breast cancer, all kinds of anything that can be receptive to estrogen. Um, someone mentioned DVTs, right? So it puts you in a pro-coagulant sort of state. It actually stimulates the liver to make more clotting factors. Um, so there's issues with it, right? Um, what we can do is actually give a medication that just doesn't act at a as a agonist to every single tissue, but it acts only as an agonist in certain types of tissues, right? Um, so originally a lot of these serums got their start as being used for things like breast cancer, where if you still wanted some estrogen activity in places like the bone, but I wanted to spare the breast from being activated, because again, by stimulating the, that tissue, it worsens the cancer, right, if it's more receptive to that. And so what I can do is give something that's going to be an antagonist of certain tissues, but an agonist of the bone, and that will actually help to prevent that. So we'll talk more about this later on when we get to the ob gyn section at a later date, so don't worry too much about that one. Um, calcitonin, this is, um, you know, I like to mention when where drugs come from because I think it's interesting and may help you remember some of these things. You know, it's like plant sources are a big one. Um, this is probably the weirdest one of where it comes from. It actually comes from salmon sperm. Again, who the scientist was that figured this out? <laughs> no clue, but thank goodness they do the work they do so we don't have to, right? Um, but calcitonin is a natural thing that we produce ourselves, right? So again, it's interesting that we have other animals, even like a fish, that can produce something similar to what we do. But basically, it's a normal hormone that gets released from the thyroid gland that's basically going to be the opposing force to PTH, right? So this is going to help to suppress osteoclast activity. Normally, you'd suppress or you'd release calcitonin if you had hypercalcemia. We can give this to actually help to inhibit um, those osteoclasts. This is one is given as an intranasal medication, so its oral bioavailability is not going to be great. So we actually use that as a nasal spray uh, for patients there. This is not great because as you get further away from the bisphosphonates with some of these other therapies, they don't have as good of evidence to show um, that they prevent all sorts of fractures. So for instance, here we find that calcitonin is good for vertebral fractures, but there's no good evidence to show that it prevents hip fractures. Again, why it's very specific in that regards, who knows, but that's what the clinical trials really told us, right? Um, Typically, we'll talk about this a little bit more in endocrinology later on, but um, this is more frequently used for hypercalcemia, so things like Paget's disease and whatnot. You may see this used a little bit more frequently for that. This is sort of like a second, third line agent for uh, osteoporosis. Uh, we've known called teriparatide, and this is going to be for, again, patients who have failed bisphosphonates or really at high risk for fractures. And actually, this is interesting because it's just the first 34 amino acids of PTH. Right? So it ends up having kind of similar activity, and in, in what you actually find is that normally it's considered to be sort of an anabolic agent. When I say anabolic, what does that mean? It's meant to build things up, right? So um, normally it's meant to stimulate kind of bone formation. It actually helps to stimulate osteoblast number and activity, so you should be actually helping to lay down more bone in those cases there. Um, problem though is if you kind of stimulate too much activity of the bone, what do you think can happen? If you're stimulating the cells to replicate, and lay down more bone and get cancer that can actually happen there. So it's a RIMS program. You guys remember what a RIMS is? Risk evaluation mitigation strategies. We talked about like Accutane and stuff like that. This one's actually for uh, bone cancer risk. So actually they put a limitation on how long you can receive it because the longer you're on it, the more likely you are to develop bone cancer because of that. So again, when you're looking at these patients here, typically you're going to see that obviously what's the first thing you're going to do for these patients? 
calcium and vitamin D supplementation, right? So again, uh, make sure that they can actually activate the vitamin D that you're giving them. Just drinking a glass of milk a day may not be necessarily enough for them, right? And again, we fortify most of our milk with the vitamin D already in it, so there is some additional benefit there, but they may need exogenous supplementation, right? Um, if they have bad kidneys, what am I going to give them? Or bad liver, kidneys, what am I going to give them? Remember, calcitriol is going to be the go-to there, right? Because that's the form that's already activated. If they can't do it themselves, then we need to do it for them, give them the activated form. What do you think the cost-wise that does for it? It's typically more expensive, right? Calcium carbonate, I can go and get a million of them from Costco for probably nothing, right? Versus calcitriol, prescription-only product, it's going to be more expensive in those cases there. But anyway, based on their you know bone mineral density scans, whatnot, as they come back, certainly start off with the easy stuff, start with calcium and vitamin D supplementation. After that, what would I go with? Usually bisphosphonate, alendronate, or um, ibandronate, any of those would be totally fine. A lot of it has to do with what their insurance will cover, how often they want to take it, things like that. If they can't take it orally, if they don't, if you're worried about bioavailability, what do you go with? That zoledronic acid, right? That reclass is going to be the thing to do one time IV infusion. Right, uh, or when, once yearly IV infusion. Um, at that point, then it's kind of more sort of nebulous at that point what you're going to go with, right? A lot of patients will either try like the um teriparatide, calcitonin, they can all be used, but they're not going to be as good as the bisphosphonates. That's really the thing you want them to try to stick with if possible, right? Okay, uh, any questions on that? All right, moving forward, let's talk about gout. What is gout? <laughs> yes, you're getting. Sodium urate crystals that are precipitating out. Where do they like to precipitate out at? Fingers. What is like the classic presentation? The great toe. What's so great about that toe? That's what I want to know. I think it's just an okay toe. Hmm? It's a pretty good toe, actually. It's big. You can stand up because of it. Yeah, it's great. Um, you guys ever seen those old, like really old school pictures? Uh, people with gout and have a, the little devil with a pitchfork kind of like poking the guy in the toe. Like, I always love those. They're always cute. Um, why was this considered like a rich person's disease back in the day? Yeah, because if you had the money to eat a lot of meats and things like that. It'd be, okay, so, so meat was associated with gout. Why is that? Because as we break down the amino acids in proteins, what do we get? You can eventually get uric acid, right? The purines and whatnot that you're breaking down in the proteins actually turn into uric acid. And that's where these patients had hyperuricemia. They were getting, the concentration was getting too high. They were eventually precipitating out in the joints and that's where the gout was coming from, right? Because again, you have these crystals that are poking the tissues and it's just, it's, it's a painful thing as you might imagine, it's this physical sort of thing. Um, there's also gonna be some inflammation that's gonna come about from that as well, as we'll see, and that will make sense when we get into some of the medications that will be useful here. Anyway, but also, you know, it's not just the, the joints that can be affected, certainly the kidneys, you can get, uh, you know, urolithiasis, um, um, interstitial damage can actually happen from this. You do want to be, be cautious with that as well, right? Um, anyway, as I mentioned, you know, degradation of purines was actually going to produce this uric acid. So what do you think are some ways I could deal with that? What are some ways to prevent gout potentially? Like things that make uric acid. Hmm? Prevent the things that make uric acid. Okay, so maybe if I can prevent uric acid from being formed, all right, so we'll look at some ways we can do that. What else? What's the easiest thing to do? To do? Tell them to stop eating so many purines, right? Tell them, have them lower the protein amount um, they're getting in their diet, right? Um, things like that could, could be potentially useful in, in helping to mitigate this, right? But anyway, um, patients who are typically most likely to experience gout are either going to be the overproducers or the under-excretors, right? Kind of breaking down into two categories there. So if they have like an enzyme abnormality that causes them to produce more of it, if they have an increased breakdown of nucleic acids, anyone that might have that happen? What if I, for instance, you know, you know we get nucleic acids, our purines, you know, coming from our DNA, so if we have a lot of cells that are all lysing at the same time, when could that happen? Cancer, yeah. So if we have someone with leukemia, they come with an extremely high white cell count, we give them chemotherapy, and all of a sudden all the cells die off at roughly the same time, all that uric acid can get formed and can cause severe kidney injury, right? So we call that um, uh, tumor lysis syndrome. We'll talk about that briefly a little bit later on. Um, or if you have excessive cell turnover, so a lot of those myo myeloproliferative it's really hard to say this early in the morning. Myeloproliferative disorders can also lead to that as well. So that's a big concern we have for kids that are new onset. Um, certain types of leukemias, we really worry about that um, tumor lysis syndrome that can happen there. And then under excretion, 
could just be idiopathic, maybe your kidneys are not up to the task of excreting as much as you have, and then dehydration can also exacerbate this, right? So less con or less fluid you have, more concentrated things get, more likely it's going to precipitate out, right? So. Um, kind of two modes of therapy here. We have sort of the acute management of an acute gouty attack, and then we have sort of um, means of trying to prevent the episodes from occurring in the first place. And so um, we'll look at either our anti-inflammatories that can help out with some of that, or the urate lowering therapy. So if I get less uric acid being produced, then less likely to have gout. So in terms of acute treatment, yeah, you can apply things like ice, but it's probably not going to be the most effective way to, to manage that pain for those patients there, right? So typically, you're going to go with things like NSAIDs are going to be big. Sometimes corticosteroids can be used to help out that inflammation. Um, you know, this is something where things like, you know, IV Toradol is a really good one if you have patients presenting like to your ER and they're just in a ton of pain, their toes is killing them. Give them some Toradol, they're going to feel much better after that. And there's also another agent we'll talk about briefly called colchicine. It's actually a, kind of a new drug. We'll, we'll mention, it's an old drug, but it's a new one for you guys. We'll, we'll mention it here briefly. Um, typically, you want to start early if you can, and most time patients, um, especially if they have recurrent episodes, like they'll kind of know when it's coming on, and they will have as needed prescriptions that they can just fill and go ahead and take that. So, for instance, I know like my dad would have gout occasionally. Um, he always had a prescription for Celebrex. He always had some available, so that way if he knew it was coming on, he'd just take a Celebrex for that, and it helped out prevent some of the uh, sort of the severity of the onset, right? Um, and again, you typically will find combination therapies can going to be more beneficial if a lot of joints are being affected um, or just the more severe the, the symptoms are, right? So we'll talk about pain management slides and, and our inside stuff coming up, so just wait for that. Um, in terms of corticosteroids, they tend to be pretty equivalent, but remember there's a lot more side effects associated with that than the NSAIDs. But typically this is a pretty short course, maybe just a few days worth of therapy there, so I'm not too worried about um, you know long-term complications from say like an acute gouty attack like this. Um, in some cases, they would actually do intraarticular injections, kind of like we were talking about for like RA or osteoarthritis, so things like a triamcinolone or Kinolog injection may be useful to just inject it right to the joint itself. Um, but if it's more than two joints, typically that's when we're going to do more systemic therapy there, right? And remember, if they do need it for more than a week, that's where you consider doing your taper. How do you taper if you're giving an injection? Well, those you don't have to worry about it, right? Um, yeah, that's just with the intraarticular ones. You don't have to worry about that. This is if I was to say were to give the patient a script for prednisone to take home and, and fill that. That's when you want to consider doing the taper. So colchicine or colchris, this is actually an antimitotic drug. Um, this is actually has a plant-based origin. It actually comes from um, there are certain types of um, beads and uh, that they're like seeds that they will sometimes use for like jewelry, like for like kind of rosary beads. I don't remember the specific plant name. I don't, I don't recall right at the second. Um, but basically, this is actually an issue where if like patients were to like eat some of these seeds and actually chew them up, they can actually release colchicine. So there are some plant-based um, origins for this. But it's an anti-mitotic drug. And so basically, it's kind of working as an anti-inflammatory because it actually prevents um, the white cells from, from replicating there. It prevents some of their um, sort of um, chemotaxis to the area where they can actually cause that inflammation. Um, it actually helps to prevent microtubules from, from forming, right? And we've talked about drugs that interrupt microtubules before. Anyone remember where that was? Yeah, I remember we talked about um, taxanes. We talked about, um, there's another group. The epidophila toxins, like a toposide, was another one that they both affected um, the actual. Actually, no, was, I'm sorry, the vinc alkaloids that did that, right? Remember the vincristines and things? They actually affected the mitotic spindles. This is another drug that actually does that, right? So um, it actually prevents um, the neutrophils from migrating because they don't have the cytoskeleton to really kind of make that um, locomotion actually happen there. And so this is another one, again, it's been around for forever and is usually used for those acute gouty attacks. It's interesting, the dosing used to be you just kept giving the drug until the patient threw up, and then you say, okay, that's enough. So basically, you kind of uh, the efficacy was limited based on the toxicities the patient experienced because this stuff is like really cytotoxic, and in fact, if there's ever a way you would not want to kill yourself, it would definitely be a colchicine because it'd be a very slow, painful death, um, you get terrible myelosuppression, die from infection. It would not be great. So um, a lot of better means to, to do so. Anyway, um, so you can't see neutropenia because of that, and then also it can develop this neuromyopathy due to some of the, the cytotoxic effects there, so it would be something to be concerned with. Typically, this is more like an as-needed sort of basis. They're going to use it if they know an attack's coming about or if they're in the middle of one. Um, I don't see this really given in the ER as much. Typically, I see a lot of inset and corticosteroid use, but they may get, say, an as-needed prescription they'll get sent home with for colchicine. They may use that occasionally. So, and again, based on 
kind of the pain and, and severity here, typically the more severe it is, that's when you're gonna go with more combination therapy, right? So you can consider things like colchicine plus an NSAID or maybe plus a steroid. Um, typically monotherapy can be reasonable if it's more mild to moderate, right? Or if they're at home and they're dosing themselves potentially. Um, and again, obviously the, the whole point is you want the, the episode to resolve pain to go away and then they, they should be good at that point. Um, we will look at a few ways we can actually prevent the actual attacks from happening though. And so some ways we can help to prevent recurrent attacks is one, to get those lower uric acid levels either through diet or um, doing things that limit limiting alcohol intake, especially a lot of purines sometimes in certain forms of alcohol. Also, what does alcohol do to your volume status? Do people they wake up and they're nice and refreshed and hydrated after a night of drinking? <laughs> No, you feel like death warmed over, right? So because you're very dehydrated and you have a hangover because of it, right? Because anyone know why you get dehydrated because of alcohol? Mm, it's a hormonal issue. You block ADH from being released, right? It actually inhibits ADH release. And so basically when you break the seals because you don't have ADH holding back all that water in the kidney, so you don't have to urinate so much. So anyway, so that again, remember, Dehydration can actually lead to that precipitation of those uric acid crystals, right? Um, also, a lot of medications um, in terms of like diuretics can also do this as well. So like your thiazides and your loops, they actually cause the kidneys to hold on to more uric acid. So that's certainly a concern. Um, things like niacin can actually help to exacerbate this and even low dose aspirin can, can worsen that to some degree. So certainly medications can play a role here, right? If you think about like, you know, an older, like you know, middle-aged guy, eats a lot of red meats, you know, gets gout recurrently, probably has cardiovascular disease, he's probably on low dose aspirin anyway, right? So that could be a contributory sort of factor when you think about it. All right, All right so our urate lowering therapy, we tend to find that if they have, say, more than two attacks a year, they tend to be pretty good candidates for this. Um, and then so we can either do things by decreasing the synthesis of uric acid, and there's a specific enzyme we can inhibit, one called xanthine oxidase. And then we can also increase the excretion. This is going to be less common to use. Typically, we stick with the, uh, the xanthine oxidase inhibitors. Um, but the, the term for increasing uric acid excretion is called uricosuric, right? So basically, you're peeing out more and more uric acid. So basically, it's a pretty complicated process here in terms of how our nucleic acids eventually get broken down into uric acid. The only thing you really need to focus on here, though, is the xanthine oxidase, right? That's the one you're really concerned about. So by inhibiting this enzyme here, you're stopping sort of the end of the chain, and you'll find that things like xanthine and hypoxanthine, we can, they're much more water-soluble. We can eliminate that much easier than uric acid itself specifically. And so using those inhibitors there, again, we're preventing the production of uric acid such that there should be less of it that's able to precipitate out and causing a gouty attack in the first place. Um, far and away, the most common one, and again, it's a pretty old drug, is going to be allopurinol, or xyloprem is the brand name. Um, in terms of this one, we will see that it's pretty well tolerated for a lot of patients, but you can see issues of leukopenia potentially. GI upset's pretty common with this one, and there could be issues of skin manifestations, so things like toxic epidermal necrolysis, Stevens-Johnson, all of that. So you do want to warn them about any skin manifestations that pop up. You should be concerned with that, right? Any other drugs in this section we've talked about this past couple of weeks that are really concerning from that standpoint as well? Remember, Lamictal was a big one, right? But remember, in general, a lot of the anti-epileptic drugs can do that as well. So like carbamazepine, phenytoin, all, a lot of those you're also going to be worried about that as well, right? A newer drug we have called Favuxastat or Euloric. Um, this one is a little bit better tolerated, but because it's newer, Typically, it's prescription only, it's brand name only, it's going to be a little more expensive. So, um, I'm sorry, both of these are actually prescription only, but that one's going to be brand name, and uh, so it's going to be more expensive. So, maybe if they're not, um, you know, they can't tolerate allopurinol due to side effects, that's when you probably switch them over to, to Febuxostat. Um, there are some things we could do to help increase excretion of uric acid, but again, what could be the problem if we're trying to increase the amount of uric acid the kidneys are sending out? you basically have them precipitate out in the kidneys, right? So that's one concern you have there. And there's an old drug we used to have, um, still used occasionally called probenicid. Um, again, about a 10% chance they're gonna get that nephrolithiasis, right? So again, it's not an unheard of concern there. Um, what's interesting though is we used to give probenicid actually along with penicillins. Um, back in the day, back when um, it was very difficult to get penicillin, we wanted to extend the half-life of it and prevent it from being renally excreted. And so we'd actually give this with probenicid and it actually helped to inhibit secretion of penicillins into the renal tubules to be eliminated such that the half-lives would stay around for longer. Um, so that's what it used to be used for. We also found that it helps to prevent reabsorption of uric acid in the kidneys and will help to excrete it faster. 
Typically, though, you're not going to give this for patients um, which are high risk for nephrolithiasis and poor kidney function. We wouldn't want to use that for them. This is an interesting one. Um, here's when we have Raspiracase or Elatec. This is actually a, um, a engineered enzyme that we have produced. It actually is a recombinant form of urate oxidase. And so once you produce that uric acid, this will actually go in and cleave it directly. And so this is where we'd use it most frequently for um, tumor lysis syndrome after patients were receiving that chemotherapy. And in fact, we were just reviewing it. I know when I was leaving my shift on Monday, there was a kid um, who we were actually reviewing the criteria for use to make sure to see if we needed to actually use respiracase. So it's a very um, pretty rare drug we're going to use, but it could be life-saving potential, at least kidney-saving in a lot of cases there. Um, I didn't get the full cost on it, but I think it's something like, you know, at least $100,000 for just um, one dose of the drug to help, to help treat those patients. So we have very tight reins on it. We want to make sure that patients who need it, like they really need it, um, before we end up sending that out because, um, you know, we usually don't get a lot of good reimbursement for that sort of thing. Um, one concern, though, is you could induce hemolysis because this is an oxidizing sort of uh, medication here. And so especially if they have a G6PD deficiency, that can be a concern. You guys familiar with G6PD deficiencies? What can, that, what can that lead to? You've heard of it, right? So at least you've heard of it, but I, this is one of those things. It's just like SIDH when I was like in school. Like I kept hearing about it, and I was like, oh, yeah, that, that thing, thing can cause that. But I didn't really know what it meant. And so G6PD was that for me for a long time, too, until I actually like saw it manifest. Um, basically, G6, G6PD is an enzyme that helps to relieve oxidative stress. The problem you're going to see with some of these drugs that can exacerbate that is they will oxidize, um, specifically they can oxidize the iron that's in your hemoglobin, right? So basically you can go from a ferrous state to a ferric state, so it's like 2 plus iron to 3 plus iron. The problem with that is, is that your hemoglobin doesn't like to bind to oxygen anymore. What it does like to bind to is water. And so that's when you get methemoglobinemia, okay? Because basically your blood is holding onto water instead of uh, oxygen, and that turns the blood what color? Anyone know? Turns your patient blue essentially because the the uh, hemoglobin, which is now methemoglobin, is uh, very dark in nature. So if you ever hear like chocolate brown blood, that's methemoglobinemia. Like the nurse will pull out a, a, a sample and it looks like chocolate. Um, that's actually going to be met hemoglobin. It could be like a board style question that might come up. The problem with it is if you keep oxidizing that iron, eventually you're going to lead to hemolysis, which it can lead to, um, obviously you have no hemoglobin at that point to actually carry oxygen, and that can be very bad for your patient. So um, that's a concern. If you ever see a blue patient, someone who looks very cyanotic, but they're in no acute distress, that's probably met hemoglobinemia as well. Because normally you see a blue patient, you're like, oh boy, this isn't good. But they're like, what's up? No big deal. Um, that could be as a result of G6PD deficiency. Anyway, um, so again, if they have recurrent attacks, this is where you're at lowering therapy. Most often, allopurinol is going to be the one to go with uh, Febuxist as a backup. Uh, and then if they need it as needed, you know, corticosteroids, colchicine, NSAIDs, probably NSAIDs are going to be kind of the first line you're going to go with in a lot of those cases there. Okay. Any questions on that? If not, let's take an early 10-minute break. We'll come back and then start our pain management section. Okay, so I have two questions. Uh, would peglodicase be a good uricolytic uh, for use for gout? Um, so that would actually fall into the same category. I just looked it up because I haven't seen that drug. Uh, I think I heard the brand name one time before. It's called Christexa is the brand name. Um, that would be kind of in the same case as uh, respiracase, which we mentioned uh, before. So that would probably be a really expensive medication. I probably would not want to go ahead and use that as like a first line. Um, but it could be as an alternative to something like respiratory case. So I don't, I don't have a lot of experience with it, though. Um, will cooking in a cast iron skillet help iron deficiency, iron deficient anemia? What do you guys think? No? Yes? Hmm. There actually is some iron that will come off with the food. So actually, like in old timey days, like that's where they got a lot of the source of their iron was cooking with these cast iron skillets. Now, if I had a patient with a hemoglobin of nine, do I think that this is going to like correct their anemia? I mean, unless they're eating the pan itself, pro probably not, right? But it certainly will not hurt in those cases there. So yeah, they're able to do that. Probably like one of those like, those like strong uh, man competitions or something or like been in a rebar with their hands. But um, yeah, so yes, it, it could it could help. It's not going to hurt that in that case there. Okay. So let's talk about, we're going to focus a lot on pain management in this section because a lot of ortho complaints come along with pain. And so this is my way of kind of piggybacking the topic of pain management into this section here. So let's talk about it. what is pain? Nociception. Nociception. What, what does that mean? What is that? 
Is it a, an inherently objective sort of thing? No. A lot of people say pain is whatever the patient says it is, right? You guys buy that definition? A lot of it is very subjective, right? I mean, pain is going to be one of the toughest things you're going to encounter, especially if you're working in like ERs and these patients coming up and saying, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain, give me something for it. And you got to decide, what am I going to give them, right? Am I going to give them anything? Is this legitimate pain? Can people lie about their pain? Yes, and but you shouldn't assume everyone's lying about their pain. So it's very easy to get to a kind of jaded sort of uh, mindset with a lot of this stuff. Um, I will tell you, like my first experience with this was when I was um, interning at a CVS. It was during my first year of pharmacy school, and I would have patients that would come in. You know, it was like Saturday morning or something. Patients come in from their uh, prescription the ER, and they would have an antibiotic for a tooth infection, and they would have a, a prescription for Lortab. And they say, "Don't worry about the antibiotic. Just give me the Lortab." And I'd be like, but you, it says you have a tooth infection. You should probably treat that with antibiotics. He's like, no, just give me the Lortab. Um, and I was like, okay, well, this seems bogus, but my pharmacist said to go ahead and fill it. And, and that was that, right? So um, that patient likely had pain. I don't know, but it didn't seem very, very convincing at that point. But, um, you know, and you'll have some people, like, even like old school pharmacists, like some of them are just, I'm just never going to fill a C2 prescription, which is like kind of inherently kind of, kind of, bad practice because I mean, some patients have legitimate concerns there but a lot of people tend to get jaded you'll find providers that will just say and i'm not going to give narcotics to anyone right and so that's just how, how they practice but um pain's a big concern a lot of people complain of pain and so your job is to figure out okay well how am i going to manage this right um there's a lot of barriers to appropriate pain management not only are people trying to gain the system and kind of malingering um but also like a lot of people will be fearful of getting appropriate pain management because they're worried about things like addiction, right? They're worried about, they say, oh my gosh, we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic. I don't want to become one of those addicted people. And then they have legitimate pain that's just not being managed, right? Um, and also like, you know, how much actual training do you guys get on pain management? Like, you know, people actually just do this as their specialty. There's all fellowships designed for this. Um, but you as, you know, providers are going to go out there and, and prescribe medications right off the bat. So we don't get enough training, training on this kind of thing. Um, you know, and also just from your standpoint, you may be worried about, you know, say the government monitoring how much you're prescribing. Um, you worry about getting your patients addicted. There's a lot, a lot of barriers to, to appropriate pain management of these patients here. So, um, and again, you know, it could be issues of access to people who have appropriate training for this, people who, um, you know, are going to get reimbursed for this effectively. Um, so a lot, a lot of problems with this. And, and we'll kind of talk about the opioid epidemic that we're in and kind of why we're there. Um, I will recommend if you're interested in the topic, which I certainly am because, you know, it kind of fuels a lot of my business from like a toxicology standpoint, so to speak. We have a lot of overdoses for opioids and whatnot. Um, I do have a video on my channel which you can check out. I think it's like the first one that pops up uh, on there, but it's about opioid prescribing for PAs. And it was I did it was a talk I did for the um, winter FAPA I think last year, uh, and it kind of goes through kind of why we're at the pain crisis that we're in, we're in, in the opioid epidemic, some of the things that led up to that. And so it could be interesting for you if you're if you're if you want to hear more of me talking, then you already have to. <laughs> and hit that subscribe button, right? It just <laughs> past 300 uh, subscribers and I was very excited about that so <laughs> slowly inching my way up there to 1 million <laughs> at this rate 3,333 that year that would be my year so um, anyway so as I mentioned it's a this is an inherently subjective sort of thing their patients you know, whatever the pain they say it is is what it is essentially and so you're you know what you need to do is make sure you're actually doing good assessments on them actually figure out you know how, how is, are they being legitimate when they say that they're in pain? What kind of pain are they experiencing? What are some other way, like more objective ways you can determine patients' pain levels and how effective maybe some of your treatments are going to be? Because you can ask my pain scale, right? You can say from a scale of 1 to 10, what's your pain? 10 being the worst pain you can imagine. 10 being childbirth. And you're like, I'm definitely an 11. And you're like, you're just sitting there. You look fine. No, I'm definitely an 11. <laughs> You can't deny them that, right? They, they say what it is. But what are some things objectively you can look at to see, like, okay, well, are they really in pain? Look at their vital sign, right? Blood pressure. Look at their heart rate. What else? Are they writhing in agony on the gurney in front of you? That could be a sign, right? Um, people could fake that, but still. Um, you know, look at their, like, functionality. Like, you know, can they do the things? Can they go to work, right? Can they get up and actually move around and do the things that they want to do? A lot of times pain is very you know, disabling, um, are they actually gaining function, right? These are things you're going to be looking for here. 
And so, um, you know, for a while they said like, you know, pain is like the, the fifth vital sign. And that is what kind of fueled a lot of the opioid epidemic and why so many people are always asking, are you in pain? Do you show up for, you know, um, you know, for the flu and they say, are you in pain? And then they would want to treat it because it was one of those things like the Joint Commission was pushing it and most people are pushing uh, for this and that's where we kind of got to where we are today. But um, looking at pain in terms of acute versus chronic, you'll find that's going to be managed quite differently. So for instance, like with your prescription assignment, this is more of an acute pain episode, right? Because we put the patient under surgery um, instead of being more of a chronic sort of issue, which you'll see with like things like osteoarthritis, et cetera. Um, certainly the kind of three etiologies we're going to focus on are going to be somatic, neuropathic, and visceral. Um, neuropathic you're going to find is treated quite differently than the somatic and visceral, right? So for instance, your pain or your patient that went under that um, NUS procedure, what type of pain are they experiencing? I think it's a neurologic issue they went under surgery? No, it's probably a more somatic and visceral kind of thing because you cut open the patient and that's why they're sore, right? You put a big metal bar in their chest and flip it upside down and get to expand their chest out probably more of a visceral sort of pain as you might imagine um, versus something being more of like a neuropathic issue like with diabetes or due to um, you know shingles or due to whatever these things that cause these the actual nerves themselves to be kind of out of, out of whack but looking at their reason or looking at some of the, the differences between acute versus chronic pain typically with acute pain it's more predictable you kind of know what kind of uh, time frame you're kind of looking at for these patients here primary treatment is going to be analgesics in a lot of cases here, right for more chronic pain, though, this is where you got to look at multimodal sort of therapy here. This is where you got to be able to incorporate other disciplines into your management. You know, talk to your physical therapist, talk to your um, your pharmacist, talk to all the different team members um, because they're going to be able to provide additional help there. We're going to focus on the analgesics, but there's certainly a lot of other things you need to really focus on to get these patients well, right? Um, as I mentioned, that nociceptive pain, more visceral, somatic sort of pain. Obviously, you know, it's going to be more expressive, like a sharp, dull, aching, throbbing. How does neuropathic pain sort of manifest. Tingling, burning, shooting kind of pains there, right? And again, the etiology is different there, so we're going to be treating that differently. We'll look at some medications that can help out with that. Obviously, it's quite costly. Um, it's affecting patients' quality of life, not only just physically, but psychologically. You tend to find that things like anxiety and depression tend to go hand in hand with chronic pain. They tend to worsen one another. Um, they lose abilities to do things and that causes them to spiral even further through their mental health issues and so um, again managing all aspects of their disease states can can really be beneficial from the pain standpoint so um, obviously optimal pain management has to do with optimal pain assessment right so when you guys are assessing pain in a patient getting your histories what are you asking about where is it at where does it go is it new pain? Is it old pain? Is it, what makes it better? How would you describe it, right? Um, right, so there's a lot of things to go into. I'm not going to tell you how to elicit your histories because you've gotten it from a lot more knowledgeable people than me for sure. But some of the things I will focus on are things that um, can help you to deduce like how, how we should be managing this pain here, right? How do we decide which medications? How do we choose how to manage these uh, guys? Do we just want long acting meds, short acting? How do, how do we decide these things here, right? Um, certainly you want to ask about the onset and the duration. Like, you know, is this a very acute sort of thing? Has it been a long standing problem? A lot of times patients will come in with chronic complaints and you say, well, they come to the ER and say, oh, I have pain. They're like, well, how long has it been going on for? Like, for months. And they're like, well, it's 3 a.m. on a Sunday night. Like, why are you coming in now? Like, what is your emergency, right? And you have to kind of figure that sort of thing out. Like, is it something, is it an acute on chronic issue? What, what's really going on here, right? And again, ask about those characteristics, right? So you can figure out, okay, is it more of a neuropathic sort of issue? Is it more somatic? And, and you guys have great training on that. So you know exactly how to kind of delineate between those two there. Um, Certainly asking about pain scales can be problematic. I'm not going to show you this YouTube video, but this is about a guy who's experiencing pain. He's trying to figure out the right number to tell the provider um, his, on his pain scale was so that way he actually got medication. Because if you go too low, then they're probably not going to give you anything good. They'll probably give you some Tylenol. If you give them like, you know, something that's like way out of proportion and tell them I'm an 11, they'll think you're lying and they won't give you anything. So he finally said eight was the right number. He said eight was definitely the good number to tell them because that way he got the morphine. All right, so I know you can check that out. But, um, Point being is, is that, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, pain is being very subjective. My 10 might be very different from your 10, right? Who typically has higher pain tolerance, men or women? 
women, right? So they may say that they're a four, and I'd probably be like a 12, right? So um, a lot of it goes into that. I've never experienced childbirth, so I have no idea how to equate pain on that sort of level there, right? So uh, a lot of it has to do with past experiences and things like that. But um, so, and again, you can ask about, you know, mild, moderate, severe, but again, all, all that's extremely subjective. There, there are other things you can do too, though. So for instance, like using a, a visual analog scale, it's just a 10 centimeter line. What do you think some benefits are to that? Because basically, you just ask them to, to point on the line where their pain is, and they would point to it. Um, and then you can give them the medications, come back, have them point to where they feel like their pain is at that point. Uh, and then you measure the difference, right? You can actually measure um, the distance to see how well the pain be, is being managed now. The benefit to that is what do you think? They can't just give you a number, right? They just can't say, oh, yeah, I'm still a 10. Definitely a 10. Like, actually, you know, it kind of limits some of that to some degree because you know, you're less likely to be able to point to the exact same spot, you know, 8.7 centimeters versus 8.4, right? Um, so that can be useful. But again, some people like, you know, especially these, these like 1 to 10 pain scales. So my, my wife, uh, being a pharmacist, she did her second year residency in pain management at the VA, right? And so you got a lot of these like old salty veterans and stuff have all kinds of chronic pain issues. And they would have people who, you know, come in and be like, hey, how's your pain doing today? And they're like, oh, I'm an 8 out of 10. You say, okay, well, let's go look at your medication list. And let's try to change things around. We're going to add this thing on, modify this dose, all of that, right? So they come back a couple days later and say, hey, how are you feeling? And he's like, oh, I feel great. I can get up. I can move around. What's your pain? It's still an eight. And it's like they psychologically kind of get like tied to that number. It's like part of their identity to a point. So, again, the pain assessment can be really difficult with some of these, uh, especially chronic pain issues here. Um, and we've seen like the Wong Baker faces scale, right? So like, how do you describe your pain, um, you know, in terms of like, how would it look? can help out with children, right, of a certain age. Um, so for instance, like, it's really kind of cool seeing my three-year-old, she's starting, kind of like starting to get like emotions, or she's always had emotions, but she's starting to like, understand like the physical manifestations of emotions. So right now when she like, we like scold her for something or she gets like upset about something, she will like put on the biggest frown, like it literally looks just like this. I have no idea how she can torture her face. She will slump her shoulders and then go walking over to her mom to, to get some consolation. And it's, it's the cutest thing you've ever seen, but it's like just interesting to see like, okay, she actually knows that when she sees that, that means sad. Or if she sees me, she's like, that means mad, you know. <laughs> but, but again, different ways to try to get the, the assessment out of them. Obviously, you know, two-year-old's not gonna be able to figure that out, but maybe she could at least, you know, kind of point to, hey, how does your pain feel right now? Um, obviously, you're asking about you know what makes things better, what makes things worse. I think it's really important to ask about what they've already tried, because again, if they've already tried something before that didn't work for them, and then you try to do the same thing, they're going to think like you're not very competent, right? Um, oftentimes, we'll try to figure out what they've used just immediately prior to coming and seeing you, especially for acute pain stuff. So, for instance, if um, Say for instance, you know, uh, we have a lot of, we have like a contract over at Nemours with Disney, so that way if someone gets hurt on their premises, they typically get transported over to us, and so we get a lot of, um, uh, you know, like the wide world of sports they have over there, like there's a lot of like competitions, like you have like cheerleading and football, all kinds of stuff. They get injured, they come over to see us, right? So um, we ask some questions, like, okay, well, you know, make sure you talk to the EMS provider, say, well, this person just broke their arm, did you give them anything in route? Because that will then indicate, okay, well, do I need to give them more medication? Um, do I need to try something different if that didn't work for them? Etc. You know, if a patient says, oh, I took Tylenol before I came in, well, how much did you take? Was it an appropriate dose? Was it not? Do you need more? Those are kind of things you can kind of figure out, right? So anyway, um, in terms of your history, obviously ask what medications are on currently, because some of them could be exacerbating issues. Some of them could be helping in some cases, depending on the situation there. And then obviously things like, you know, your lab function is, or, you know, uh, laboratory testing is important here in terms of determining what their renal function is like, what their hepatic function is like. It could either preclude whole uh, groups of medications, or it could mean you just modify your dose a little bit, depending on the situation, right? And then um, substance abuse history can be a big one. Obviously, we know there's some genetic factors to go along with this. Certainly, if you have family members who uh, have a history of addiction, you may be also uh, likely to have that same thing as well. Um, if they have an active substance abuse issue, then you may want to just avoid certain groups of medications altogether too, right? And so, so we'll look at some of that. Um, and of course, you know, psychosocial assessment, kind of figure out if they have any other underlying behavioral health issues. You want to you deal with those too. Um, looking at more like kind of chronic pain issues, it's important to understand that it's not like patients go from a zero to a 10 all the time. It's, they usually have some kind of like baseline basal amount of pain that they're experiencing here. And so that's why it's important to understand um, that you need to both treat that basal amount of pain and then also treat what we call the breakthrough pain, right? So this is why you'll see patients who may be on say long acting 
oxycodone, and then they'll have a prescription for as needed immediate release oxycodone, right? Um, because what happens when a patient who has, say, like a basal level of pain, you give them something for it and they feel better and they start to move around? Well, that may exacerbate their pain, right? That's what causes all that breakthrough pain that occurs there. So you want to have them have something available so they can go ahead and treat that, right? What happens when patients aren't having their pain really well treated with just the prescriptions that you've provided them? They start kind of doing it themselves, right? They say, well, I'm in a lot of pain, you know, they said only to take, you know, this twice a day, but it's not really cutting, especially towards the end of the day, maybe you'll just take an extra dose, right? That's where you kind of get on that slippery slope where patients try to self-medicate and that's where they can kind of get into some troubles there. And we'll look at dependency and addiction and all of that, but that's where a lot of that comes from in a lot of cases. Um, typically though, you want to kind of go by sort of an etiology-based approach, we're talking about kind of a stepwise approach to managing pain here. And here's the, the WHO uh, scale uh, of the analgesic ladder, kind of how you're gonna be progressing through this. And so um, typically they say, you know, you wanna start low and go slow. This is like the magic trick sort of thing, right? You can always go with a bigger trick. You don't wanna start the show with a showstopper, right? So in terms of that, what that means is starting off with step one, non-opioids, most commonly, right? So what are some groups of drugs you could use in that step, you think? NSAIDs, Tylenol, maybe a muscle relaxant could be like a good adjuvant, certainly. Do um, you think these are oral or IV? Oral. Typically oral, right? So these are more the mildest sets of pain here, right? And then you kind of can step it up potentially, right? So if, say for more severe pain, more kind of moderate to severe pain, you can consider starting to get into your opioids, right? Oral or IV, do you think? You can kind of go either way, right? So you could try oral opioids, right? Certainly for like at-home management, if they're going to be taking this on an outpatient basis, certainly oral. But if you're in the inpatient side, maybe you give them something IV, right? And then obviously up to the more severe pain, that's where you're going to be de definitely getting opioids on board. This is where parenteral therapy is going to be more of the mainstay there. Now, if a patient comes in and they have an obvious deformed fracture, the arm looks like a gooseneck after they, I don't know, they fell because whoever that cheerleader was supposed to catch them didn't catch them and then they fell. They get transported to the ER. I hate it when that happens. It looks like a gooseneck. Um, you know, are you going to start off by saying, here's some Tylenol. Try this out and I'm going to come back in 45 minutes to see how you're feeling. <laughs> no, you're going to start at the top of the ladder, right? Because they're in obvious pain, have an obvious deformity. Yeah, give them some IV morphine, give them some fentanyl or something. Like get the pain under control. Um, so again, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, you want to start low and go slow, but sometimes you got to kind of bump up your guns a little bit based off how they're actually presenting there, right? Um, so you don't start at the bottom rung. You can start at the top if they have a good compelling indication to do so. So um, again, kind of going through our medications, um, again, some of this will be repeats because we're talking about the, you know, things like NSAIDs and whatnot, talking about inflammation. Um, remember there's, you know, how pain gets transmitted through the body and specifically when we're talking about like somatic or visceral pain. Um, again, a lot of times, especially with injuries, we have inflammation that's occurring at the site. That signal has to get transmitted from the site of injury up into the brain. And so we're gonna see some ways we can actually interfere with that process there. But let's start at the actual site of injury where the inflammation is occurring itself. Certainly we know that when there's injury, we're gonna get things like your prostaglandins. We know there's gonna be um, histamine being released. So, you know, it gets itchy, it gets red, it gets warm, hot. You know, it's just, it, we know that happens, right? Um, what are going to be big ways that we can actually affect this at uh, this site here? What can we do for this inflammation here? A group of drugs. So yeah, so maybe antihistamine could help if there's like an itching component to it, right? What else? What's going to decrease all that inflammation coming about from those prostaglandins and all that kind of stuff? NSAIDs, right? NSAIDs are going to be a lot of your go-tos. If you're having like an obvious injury and there's inflammation, like go with an NSAID because that actually deals that inflammation that's right there, right? Um, and again, when you see a lot of these inflammatory cytokines being released, they're actually sensitizing those fibers. Remember that substance, substance P we talked about yesterday? Um, it sensitizes those fibers, so they're more likely to send those painful signals up into the CNS. You want to inhibit that if you can by using things like your NSAIDs. They're going to be really good to start with there. Imagine here you have your injury actual injury itself, and you're releasing all these different, um, you know, uh, inflammatory cytokines here, it's, it's sensitizing those fibers, be sent through the spinal column and up into the brain, right? What do you think our opioids are going to work? It's going to work more in the, the spinal column and the brain here. What do you think things like lidocaine would work? A local anesthetic. It's going to be working at the nerves right here, so actually those painful signals never actually get sent to the spinal column. So you see there's different places where we can interact with these signals such that the patient doesn't experience that pain, or at least is mitigated as much as possible. But again, focusing on just the site of injury initially, that's what we're going to be looking at first. 
So of course, um, by giving your anti-inflammatories, you're going to be decreasing production of those prostaglandins. You're going to be decreasing the amount of leukocytes that are migrating to that area there, and overall helping to in inhibit that inflammation, right? Um, and your prostaglandins are really important to helping sensitize those fibers, which is why our insects are going to be so important from this uh, standpoint. Typically, you're going to find these are better for more mild to moderate pain, right? Tylenol is typically for the most mild of cases. Insects are going to be a step up above that for sure. Um, and we can do that through inhibition of cyclooxygenase, right? Remember which one is constitutive? It's always around COX-1. It's really important for the GI protection. COX-2 is what's actually getting ramped up in these cases here. So you say you have a laceration, that's what's starting to get upregulated in terms of production. So that way we make more of those prostaglandins there. Now again, um, and how we're going to be looking at this from an etiology standpoint here, you're going to see that with somatic and visceral pain, this is where a lot of your NSAIDs and acetaminophen are going to come into play. Maybe corticosteroids if it's appropriate, you know, depending on the why the inflammation is actually occurring there. And this is where then afterwards you can consider bumping up to opioids, right? Typically for more neuropathic pain, because inflammation is not really such a big component of that, you kind of skip your NSAIDs, right? For the most part, we're going to focus on some of these adjuvant meds like our antidepressants and anticonvulsants, and we'll look at those a little bit later on. And then you can kind of step it up to opioids if need be, but you're going to find that, um, you know, ideally, what's the correct dose of, what's the, the best dose of opioids for a patient to be on? Zero. I'd like them to be on no opioids because, again, we know there's a lot of chronic problems seen with this stuff. Not that I'm opioid phobic. I think if you have a legitimate need for opioids, like, yeah, have as much as you want, but not as much as you want, but, you know, within reason. Um, but ideally, if you have people who don't need it, then you get them off of it, right? If you have other adjuvant things that can help out better than opioids, do it, right? So anyway, so when we're managing these patients here, we're going to see that, yeah, going by that multimodal approach is really going to be helpful here. Incorporate everyone on the team to kind of help out through this process to make sure you're kind of addressing each of the issues that are there. And obviously our goal is to one, um, yeah, you want to prevent and reduce pain, uh, but really the, the what now we're starting to look at more, what we've kind of realized now is not just to focus on a number, focus on actually looking at their quality of life, look at their functional capacity. Can they go to work? Can they do the things they want to do? Are they being functional? Uh, and typically you're going to find that if you have appropriate pain control, they should be regaining function, if anything, right? Not, not getting worse. Um, and again, how we're going to be treating this again based on the type, based on the severity as we're going to see there. And again, patient history is going to be playing a pretty big role as we'll mention. Um, and just know patients are going to respond differently depending on their pharmacogenetics, right? So some patients have different formulations of their opioid receptors or of their cyclooxygenase enzymes. And just because one group of drugs doesn't work for that particular patient doesn't mean all of them are not going to work. It just means you may have to kind of play around a little bit to find what works well for them. And that, again, is a common thing to ask is like, what have you been on before? What works well for you? What doesn't? Because you don't want to give them something they've already been on before that doesn't work because they're, they're going to think you don't know what you're doing, right? So um, again, looking at our options here, we're talking about acetaminophen briefly first. We'll talk about our non-steroidal drugs, getting into opioids, and then finally our adjuvant. We'll probably spend the most time on our opioids because that's kind of the newest group of drugs we haven't really talked about much yet. So Tylenol, um, again, it's a good add-on drug, right? But if you have severe pain, this is not going to be really the thing that's going to um, really be the most effective for, for pain management. What's another big thing we use it for, though? Yeah, fever is going to be the other thing that's going to be really helpful for. Um, but again, in terms of side effect profile, this one pretty good? Great, right? Almost, you know, very well tolerated. Um, really the biggest thing you have to watch out for is the liver dysfunction, right? Look out for how much you're going to be getting in terms of their total daily and max amount, right? What's the max amount for a healthy adult individual? Four grams, right? And so um, some of the things we actually find is that we consider Tylenol itself to be opioid sparing. Anyone know what that means? Basically means that if you combine Tylenol, say, with an opioid, you typically need less opioids overall in order to manage that pain just as well, right? So adding it on, overall it helps me to use less opioids. So for instance, in the surgical setting, we always give a pre-op dose of Tylenol to our patients. Either we do an IV or we do a PO before they go to surgery. Because we find that after they get out of surgery, overall they use fewer opioids in general, right? And we actually have studies to show that. And so that's why we use things like IV Ofermiv here, which is IV Tylenol. Now, um, I will tell you, in a lot of places, um, pharmacy will give you hassle if you try to overuse IV Tylenol, because you're like, well, patient's MPO, let's just go ahead and do that. And we'll be like, well, that's $35 a bottle versus like two cents for a tablet. Just have them take a tablet. Give them a suppository. It'll be fine. And then you're like, nah, I want to use IV. Um, so a lot of places will have restrictions on how, 
how you use it. So for instance, we put like a 24 hour automatic cutoff time for this, that way they're not getting it continuously. But anyway, um, uh, basically though, this is a good first line drug for a lot of patients with osteoarthritis, good way to stop or start. Um, and you're gonna find that, you know, very nice from a side effect profile. No GI issues, no bleeding issues, no addiction issues, it's great. But you have to really consider how much they're getting in total, especially when you look at other drugs that will include Tylenol in them, right? And we know what, like what, um, especially before it went to be a C2, what the like most prescribed drug in America was? Ever heard of Lortab or Norco? It's Tylenol plus hydrocodone. It was like the number one, it probably still is, I haven't looked at the list in a little bit. Um, but huge, huge uh, seller in the US. And we typically find that you have to make sure they're including all other forms of Tylenol and how much they're getting in a day because it's really easy to overdose your patients. And in fact, anyone, um, when you used to see Norco, it used to be like, you know, 5,500, or Lortab was 5,500. Um, 500 was the dose of acetaminophen. Now all of them have been bumped down to 325. You won't find the 500s anymore. Um, and we bumped that down because of that risk of hepatotoxicity for patients who are chronically taking it or combining with other over-the-counter varieties of Tylenol. And you have to ask about that over-the-counter use um, because if you don't, then they could be taking a whole bunch at home you don't know about, and then boom, they show up in their jaundice to, from head to toe, right? So um, again, we're going to find uh, that four gram limit is going to be important for most patients. Again, if they have a history of liver disease, we'll probably bump it down to 3,000 or 3,250. Um, be pretty reasonable there. But again, here's an example where you're combining, say, hydrocodone and acetaminophen 5,325 plus, say, you're taking 650 of Tylenol every six hours. Um, it very easily can go above that four gram limit. Okay, so you'd be really cautious with that. Make sure to uh, educate them on that. Now, with our NSAIDs, um, again, these are going to be good because they're analgesic, antipyretic, so again, also good for fever and anti-inflammatory. Um, again, what are the ones we can get over the counter? Yes, no? Ibuprofen. Naproxen are the two most common ones. But aspirin, you can kind of lump into this category as well. Um, remember, are those selective, non-selective? Those are all non-selective, right? So again, very few of the ones we're going to talk about are going to actually have good selectivity here. But um, and again, most of the patients have probably tried that already. They probably tried something before they come in and see you. So find out what they've been taking. Um, you know, if a patient coming to the ER complaining of pain, I say, what did you take before you came in? They say, oh, it's ibuprofen. Next dose. Uh, next question you should ask is, how much did you take? And they say, oh, I took I took one tablet. How much is that? It comes 200 milligram tablets. So they only took 200 milligrams and the patient's like a full-size adult. Is that enough? No, right? So you can give them more, right? So you have to ask about how much they took, which is why usually in those grand rounds, when you say, oh, patient took Tylenol before they came in, well, how much? You know, oh, I didn't ask. Always got to ask those questions, right? Because it could have given them a suboptimal dose and you can then supplement that and make sure they get up to the right amount. Because that may lead you to not need things like opioids potentially. <laughs> Anyway, with our NSAIDs here, we have a couple of options uh, we have available to us. So again, ibuprofen, aspirin, and naproxen, the most common over-the-counter ones you're going to run into. We have others, though. Um, I'll go over a couple of uh, different varieties here, but things like indomethacin, tolmetin, um, ketorolac, ketorolac, however you want to say it, um, otherwise known as toradol. This is like your go-to bread and butter, like IV NSAID. So this is kind of like, especially if you're working in ER, urgent care, um, you're going to be using a lot of toradol for patients. Coming in for migraines, coming in for aches and pains, sprains, whatever fractures, this is a really good IV inside to go with in a lot of cases there. Um, and a variety of doses form, so sometimes we'll have rectal suppositories available if you can't use PO, but parental is a good route to go with in those cases as well. Um, for the most part, especially if they're going to be on it for chronic management, you know, give them two to three weeks or so to see how they respond to it. This is another group where patients may respond differently based on the actual chemical structure of the inside itself and how their cyclooxygenase enzyme is kind of built. Um, again, remember the GI side effects are the big thing we worry about, especially with chronic use. We worry about those peptic ulcers that can form there. Um, what can I give along with an inside to prevent that? Soprostol or PPIs. You can do H2 blocker, but PPIs are going to be more effective overall, right? Um, in terms of bleeding risk, which ones do you think have like the highest bleeding risk? Hmm. Probably aspirin. Why? It's an irreversible inhibitor of cyclooxygenase. All the other ones, as soon as they're out of the system, they're not going to be a bleeding risk anymore, right? And so a lot of times you'll be asking, you know, especially if you're like working in the ER and you have to admit a patient to surgery, a lot of times you've already given them an NSAID before they go to surgery. And of course, that's the big risk you worry about. It's bleeding risk, but a lot of times it's not really going to be that clinically significant because once the drug wears off, the bleeding risk goes away, right? That cyclooxygenase in the platelets can start to work again. So it's a temporary concern for most of them. Um, 
Other things to be careful of, this is actually, you don't want to use NSAIDs towards the later stages of pregnancy, especially in the third stage, uh, third trimester there. Um, it can actually um, normally, you guys uh, ever heard of the ductus arteriosus? Allows for appropriate fetal blood flow um, uh, before they're born, and that's actually kept open with prostaglandins. And so, if you give an NSAID late stage in pregnancy, that can actually close that down early and can lead to problems. Um, conversely, though, once they're born, if they have a patent ductus arteriosus, we can actually use IV NSAIDs to actually close that up. So, we actually use IV ibuprofen to try to chemically close that before. If that doesn't work, then we use chemical ligation. But anyway, so again, don't uh, not not going to be preferred for pregnancy, but we'll talk more about that in a later section. Um, now, this issue with asthma and bronchospasm, why would patients be at risk for having an asthma exacerbation when taking an NSAID? Probably mentioned this back in the pulmonary section. Hmm? It goes along with that, but why? Very good, yeah, so if you go back to this pathway here, remember if you block this enzyme pathway, where does all that arachidonic acid go? And it shunted over to the lipoxygenase pathway, and leukotrienes do what to the bronchial smooth muscle? They constrict it, right? So again, if you hear about someone who has an aspirin allergy, it may not be like a true anaphylactic allergy. It could be related to this overactive lipoxygenase pathway when they receive that. But it can happen with NSAIDs uh, in general, right? It doesn't have to be aspirin. It could be ibuprofen. Any of them can do that. So that's the, the concern there you want to be cautious of. Um, also be really wary of this in patients with chronic kidney disease because again remember you can shut down the prostaglandin production in that uh, afferent arterial and cause acute kidney injury so that's nothing to watch out for yeah that's a good question most of it's based on the amount of time since the last dose so that's a good question so hey for instance like a patient came in and um, they said, oh, I took 800 uh, ibuprofen at home. That's a prescription dose, but you know, patients can dose themselves a lot of times. Um, they took 600, 800 full dose of ibuprofen, right? And so they come in, they still have this migraine, and you want to give them Toradol, right? I would say wait a certain period of time. So for instance, um, ibuprofen, you can dose that every six hours, right? Um, Toradol, I can dose every six hours as well. So once we get close to that six hour mark, that's probably where I consider going ahead and giving another dose at that point. If they say, oh, I just took a 30 minutes before I came in, I'd probably hold off on that point. Maybe try some Tylenol, I'll try something else at that point. That's a very good question, yeah. There's not necessarily a cumulative max daily amount that I'm really worried about. Um, it's more so like when's the last time they got a dose because I worry about uh, you know the GI toxicity or bleeding risk or what you know, things that go along with that. But yeah, very good question. Um, so you look up for renal function. Typically these are hepatically uh, metabolized, so you can have or hepatic function, they may kind of hold on to the drug. It could lead to some issues, but clinically it doesn't come up as often. As you mentioned, salicylates, uh, with aspirin being kind of the oddball out because it's that irreversible inhibitor. Um, and again, a lot more toxic in terms of if you're getting too much as opposed to a lot of the other NSAIDs, all kinds of uh, bad issues that can pop up. Actually, I, I don't know if I mentioned about a case a couple weeks ago um, at the poison center where a lady was, uh, she had diverticulitis and she was self-medicating with aspirin and she ended up coming in with um, a kind of uh, acute on chronic sort of presentation. And so she had, had this like really um, uh, severe late, like mixed acid-based disorder where um, aspirin actually causes a respiratory alkalosis. So she had that, and then she ended up having this concomitant, really significant metabolic acidosis. She was really, really sick, right? This is the end point. Um, so be really careful with salicylates. Remember to ask about things like BC powders and goodies, because a lot of older patients, they oftentimes will use those, and that is just pure aspirin at that point, just pure powdered aspirin. And again, um, looking at the dosing, you're going to be seeing here, again, you know, up to a gram or so, you kind of think about the dosing being pretty similar to Tylenol. Up to a gram, you're getting the antipyretic and analgesic effects. Once you're starting to get a well above that, that's where you can really run into some issues. So if they're self-medicating and they're giving themselves more and more aspirin, um, they can get themselves very, very sick very quickly. Um, and it had, had so many cases that actually occurring there. Actually, one time I had a patient, I don't know if I mentioned this, where um, the guy was taking BC powders every time he had chest pain and didn't realize that it was aspirin. No one had ever told him this. Hey, if you have chest pain, just take this. Um, and so he was doing that. He, every time he had chest pain, so one of these days, he was just having chest pain episode after episode after episode. He finally called 911. EMS gets there. They say, have you had any aspirin today? And what does he say? Nope. They give him aspirin. And then he gets into the ER. And then the resident says, hey, have you had any aspirin today? And the guy was like, nope, I haven't received anything. So then he gets another dose. So then he was having an NSTEMI on top of or a CMA, aspirin toxicity, we then had to treat that as well. So it was kind of a pretty complicated case that, that can pop up there. 
Anyway, um, be cautious when you know patients with bleeding disorders. Obviously, bleeding risk is higher with this one until you can actually produce new platelets. So it does stick around for for quite some time there. And then obviously the Ray syndrome risk, which we've talked about ad nauseum. All right, pretty pretty high morbid, uh, mortality with that if not caught early, kind of managed. Remember that it really mimics a lot of the effects of viral illness as well. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. So getting into our other NSAIDs, so a lot of them fall under this category of propionic acid derivatives. It's just their chemical structure. They're kind of all within that same chemical family there. Um, this is where like your ibuprofens and things are going to fall into play here. Um, remember, typically they're going to have less severe GI effects, but you will see more severe effects on the uh, renal function and potential for hepatic toxicity. So that's one thing to, to watch out for. But these are good wide acting medications. You'll see them used for everything from arthritis to dysmenorrhea and everything in between essentially. So um, big differences between them are typically gonna be their availability. So we mentioned that like ibuprofen and naproxen are available over the counter, pretty easy to get a hold of. Um, so again, you have to ask about, hey, what things are you taking without a prescription? So that way you can kind of capture those, um, those doses forms. And then getting up into um, the other agents, the other big differences are going to be typically their durations of action, right? So especially with more chronic pain issues, if they can only take something one time a day, that's going to be a lot more beneficial from a compliance standpoint than like, say, ibuprofen you're taking like every six hours, right? Um, and we've never seen like those commercials for naproxen, you don't know what their tagline was? It's like all day long, all day strongly. You only have to take it one time a day. And because it had a longer half-life, that was their big claim to fame over ibuprofen, was that you know, have to take it you have to take it less frequently essentially. But for instance, you have something like oxaprozin, which has you know 40 to 60 hour half-life, definitely just a once daily med, better for more chronic pain issues. Shorter acting ones are good for a more acute issues. So like ibuprofen for occasional headache, that, that makes total sense. Uh, just a few ones I'll just kind of point out some more. Um, more specific information on so like endomethacin is a pretty common one. I see a lot of patients, or a lot of providers like to use this for gout. There's no reason these ones that in said versus another. It's just kind of how they were trained and kind of what they stuck with there. Um, this one we actually used to use IV um, for those patent ductus arteriosus, but then interestingly enough, the company that makes IV ibuprofen they bought out the rights to make IV endomethacin and then they um, stopped producing it and then upcharged their ibuprofen uh, to like, just uh, just exorbitant amounts of money. So again, big pharma equals bad. Um, but uh, anyway, so uh, this one's definitely still available orally to be used for all kinds of pain conditions. Um, why do you think it would decrease the effects of diuretics? Remember, it's those kidney effects we talked about. If you're decreasing the patency of that efferent arterial by getting rid of those prostaglandins, less fluids, being getting to the glomerulus, less getting filtered, less of it to for the diuretics to actually work on, right? But good for short-term use. Um, Toradol or Ketorolac, this one is, um, like I mentioned, your bread and butter IV uh, uh, NSAID. Yes, ma'am. Maybe that's one of those things where it's like, you know, you'll find that patients may respond a little bit better or worse to different agents there. Um, there's no, like, clear consensus on like, yeah, do you have to do this one versus this one? They've just never done those trials to really say, but um, yeah, like I said, different providers will be like, yeah, this is what I've just used for 30 years and this, it's been working well for my patients. You just keep going with that, right? There's no, um, in some cases there may be a rhyme or reason to it. Um, not all providers are really gonna know necessarily why that is, but yeah, so I, I could believe it. Um, Toradol one, as I mentioned, those go to IV said This is definitely opioid sparing as well. So you can use this along with IV opioids. A lot of times this is nice too because if you have patients who are uh, maybe they have a history of substance abuse issues, um, you can definitely give them an IV dose of this and you'll get, you know, so much similar effects to some of your weaker opioids uh, for sure. So very nice from that standpoint. Um, do be aware though that it is pretty harsh on the stomach and actually we limit this just to five days of use. You don't want to use it any longer than that because your risk for peptic ulcers it goes up pretty significantly. That's actually a black box warning on that. And like, for instance, like our computer systems are designed such that you can only do a maximum of five days. And if you try to go beyond that, automatically just DCs the med and gets it off their profile. That way they don't actually accidentally get too much there. But very good drug. Um, again, if oral route is not an option, this is typically the one you're gonna go with in nine times out of 10. Uh, next, you have Tolmet. This is an oral agent that's going to be more for more chronic use. Um, here, you're going to find that uh, again, you kind of just kind of varying toxicity depending on which one you go with, and, and patients are going to respond better to one versus another in a lot of cases. Um, this one I don't see as often, mainly because of the side effect profile, more GI issues, more anticoagulant effects, but you know, decent long half life, 
you know, infrequent dosing you have to go with there. Uh, Proxicam, this one's going to be another one that has, you know, good long duration of action. Again, fewer, uh, less frequent dosing there, but again, side effects, GI effects are going to be the big thing you're going to run into there. Um, but can be effective for um, uh, things like you know, arthritis, you know, things uh, that are going to be more chronic in nature than just like an acute sort of um, pain issue. So meloxicam is a good one to mention here because now we're starting get in, getting into our more COX-2 selective agents, right? And so again, the benefits of a COX-2 selective drug is what? Less GI, Less GI effects, right? Although, what's the theoretical risk? More cardiovascular risk, right? Um, and again, nothing has been proven there necessarily, but there's a, that theoretical risk. So um, again, this probably has uh, the least amount of selectivity out of, the, say, the COX-2 selective ones, but this is a good one to start with if you want to go down that line. If they have a history of GI issues with uh, NSAID, this is a perfectly reasonable one to start with in those patients there, right? Now, Bumatone, Aurelafin is another one that has some COX-2 selectivity, not as much as something like Celebrex, as we'll see in a moment here. Um, but again, could be good for things like rheumatoid arthritis, more of those chronic sort of pain issues with those patients. Diclofenac we mentioned, this one's nice because um, not only does it have some COX-2 selectivity from like an oral standpoint, but this is also another one we have that Voltaren gel. And the benefit of using topical is what? Yeah, less systemic issues. Yeah, you get high local concentrations. You know, if you just have my left knee just, you know, um, really painful, use some Voltaren gel there and it's going to work fine for that. No real systemic effects you're going to see. Uh, and then getting into the COX-2 inhibitor specifically, as I mentioned, we talked about the, the cardiovascular risk as being uh, a theoretical concern, but yeah, some of them actually got taken off the market because they were just so COX-2 selective that they definitely led to more uh, of a more prothrombotic effect and they actually decreased angiogenesis. So you basically were just not delivering nearly enough oxygen to the heart and that was leading to exacerbating the MIs in, in some of those patients there. Stroke was also a concern, that's why they got taken off the market. But Telecoxib, which is the most COX-2 selective agent we have on the market, um, appears to be neutral from that standpoint. So again, theoretical concern for patients with a high risk cardiovascular history, I probably wouldn't start out with that, but if they have a GI history, then yeah, uh, Celebrex would be perfectly fine for that, right? Let's see. Um, and again, if you're kind of comparing like the COX-2 inhibition here between the two, you see that Celecoxib is a lot less on that scale. It's still relatively selective for COX-2, but it's not entirely so. It'll still have some COX-1 effects there. So it's not impossible for someone to have GI issues while being on Celebrex, but it's just less likely to occur, right? Okay, so those are kind of the typical opioids we go with. So um, you kind of think about like, why you'd go with one versus another. You know, COX-2 selectivity is going to be one thing you would definitely consider based on the history. You know, think about the routes that are available. If they can't take anything orally, you know, which ones are available IV to go with. It might be a good one to think about, things like Toradol. Um, those are kind of the things I want you to take away from it, right? Anyway, getting into our opioids. Anyone know where the opioids come from? The poppy plant, yes. Anyone know the scientific name? You know, wow, you with my botanical knowledge. It's the papaver somniferum is the plant name, and actually this is uh, one of these poppy plants that look like. Um, interestingly enough, it's also my wife's favorite plant. She loves that plant, and it has a, probably a lot to do with her pain management background, so she has like, pictures of poppies like hanging up in random places in the house, because um, she likes it so much. It's like, oh, it's kind of kind of cute, but um, anyway, when talking about opioids, we have a couple of different receptors we're going to mention, one of which I'm going to focus mostly on, and so we have the mu, kappa, and delta opioid receptors. Sometimes you may see these uh, referred to as OP1, 2, or 3, uh, respectively, but we're mainly going to focus on the mu receptor here. Um, and naturally, what do our bodies produce that activate those receptors? Endorphins. Also, some enkephalins are another um, compound that we produce naturally. So when you think about, like, people get, like, a runner's high, that's, like, endorphins that get released after a period of time. Um, I can tell you I've never experienced that and will never experience that. That sounds awful, okay? A lot easier ways to get high than having to run. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, typically your opioids are going to be better for more moderate, definitely more for severe pain for the most part. These are kind of the most potent agents we have to, in order to manage pain. Um, now, again, if you're thinking about things like your NSAIDs kind of working there at the site of injury, these are going to be working on both the spinal tract in order to help mitigate those painful signals from being sent up to the CNS and also within the, the brain itself. Um, again, and someone kind of described it to me that, you know, it's, it's not that you are in no pain, it's just you don't really care about the pain. Just it's kind of like, yeah, 
it's there, but I don't really care so much about it, right? Um, unfortunately, I've had very little opioid experience. Uh, I had my wisdom teeth taken out when I was a kid, and they gave me like Darvocet, which is like really wimpy stuff. Um, so I have uh, almost no experience with opioids, unfortunately. So I can't really tell you from a personal standpoint. Although I've seen a lot of people take way too many opioids, and we'll go into depth, depth about all of that. Okay, uh, that was just my weekend, right? Just kidding. Um, Professionally, I see this. Uh, anyway, so the kappa and delta receptors, they certainly have their own effects. Some of them can be proconvulsant, some can cause some dysphoria, things like that. I'm not going to focus on those because clinically they don't come up as often. Um, but the mu receptor is what I'm really con uh, concerned with here. Um, this is where you're going to get the majority of your clinical therapeutic effects and also a lot of your toxic effects. Okay, So for instance, um, the euphoria you get from using opioids, right? stimulating that, that reward pathway, right? What neurotransmitter is really important for that reward pathway? Or dopamine, right? That is stimulated through these mu receptors, right? Um, this is where you're gonna get the analgesia from when you get this. This is also where you're gonna get things like, what are the big toxicities I worry about with opioids? So constipation, respiratory depression, CNS depression, that is all mediated to these mu receptors as well. So those are the big concerns we're gonna see with that. Um, so again, mu receptors is the, what I'm concerned about. Anyway, so the differences between these medications here, a lot of it has to do with one, their potency at the receptor itself, how tightly they're going to bind to it, but also you're going to find that some of them are going to be agonist, some are only going to be partial agonist, and some of them are going to be antagonist. There's some that are kind of funky where they're like an agonist at one type and then an antagonist at another. I'm not going to get into that, but we will talk about agonist, partial, and then antagonist. Now, you guys have started your MAT training, is that correct? They talk about buprenorphine at all? Yes, that is what I'm going to talk about a lot, and that's going to be the main like partial agonist we'll mention. And what do we use buprenorphine for? Overdose. Not for overdoses. Oh, for Patients with opioid addictions to yeah. try to get them off, right? So it's going to be for opioid addiction management, right? So um, anyway, so I don't probably have enough time to kind of cover the, this topic here. So it's important to kind of know the terminology, which you've probably gotten in some of your MAT training. So hopefully this will be kind of retreading that ground, but I'll put it in my own words. Um, different features here of use of chronic use of opioids, right? So physical dependence, what does that mean? Yeah, your body has got a new normal, so to speak. It's developed a new homeostasis where the body's used to having those opioids around chronically, right? Physical dependence, is that a guaranteed thing to happen with chronic use of opioids? Thousand percent, yes. Your body gets used to a lot of things and opioids are gonna be one of those things, right? So if it around chronically, your body just gets used to having that around. That means what happens when I take that away? You go into withdrawal, how can that manifest? Yeah, they may have severe pain, maybe they have that, uh, whatever was originally causing the pain come back, right? What else? Vomiting. Chills are going to be diaphoretic, they're going to be tremulous. How's their mood going to be? They're going to be pretty cranky. What about their GI tract? Opioids cause constipation. What happens if you take all that away? Diarrhea, vomiting. Has anyone ever seen The Exorcist before? That isn't a close approximation of what full on opioid withdrawal can look like. Okay, There's ways we can actually induce that ourselves. Sometimes by accident, sometimes uh, on, on purpose, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, but that is physical withdrawal from that drug. The body is used to having those opioids around and is now craving to get that back, right? Um, that's a guaranteed thing, right? So again, most patients who are on chronic opioid, they need to wean off of it. Otherwise, they're going to have those withdrawal effects. And a lot of times, some of their behavior can be driven by preventing that withdrawal because they feel so miserable, right? And is opioid withdrawal fatal? Yeah. Not really, actually. Um, you know, for instance, we talked about things like benzodiazepines in the neurology section, how that can be fatal if you withdraw from that because it causes seizures. Not the case here. Patients are going to wish they were dead, but they're not going to die from opioid withdrawal. Okay, uh, It's very, very uncomfortable for them, um, and but they're not going to die from it. So, But that's the thing. You see some of their, their behavior is driven by the fact they don't want to go into withdrawal, and so that's why they're taking some of these drugs here. Um, in terms of addiction, what is addiction? How would you describe it to somebody? I think about it as use despite negative consequences, right? So if someone is trying to make a decision between buying themselves groceries or getting a hit of heroin, that's addiction, right? They decide to go with the heroin, right? Or if they are not able to take care of their children, 
um, because of that, or if any of these things, they lose their job because they were too high to go to work, or whatever the case may be, these are things that are addiction, right? Um, this is what we're trying to prevent. Is everyone guaranteed to become addicted to these medications? No, right? So addiction is very different from physical dependence. Everyone can get physically dependent, but that doesn't mean they're addicted, okay? A lot of times patients will get the two confused, they don't know the difference. What is tolerance? It doesn't work as well because basically, again, you've established this new homeostasis such that you need to go up on the dose, right? You need to, um, in order to get the same analgesic effect, you have to keep increasing that dose eventually. Um, so, for instance, you'll find some of these, like, you know, 90-year-old grandmas with, like, terminal cancer who are on just, like, amounts of morphine that could, like, kill a horse, basically. But they tolerate it well because they've been working up on that dose for a long period of time. Um, is tolerance, is that, like, a permanent thing once you develop that? No, as soon as you go off the opioids, it can, the tolerance is going to go away as well. And in fact, um, this is what's a big reason why a lot of patients um, who go into rehab, they actually end up dying from opioid overdoses. Um, and I actually had this in a, a distant family member, some not you know, blood related to me, but it actually happened probably a couple months ago. Um, they basically were addicted to opioids. And again, what's kind of the common one you would get that's like non-prescription based? There's a prescription opioids and there's, what do you get on the streets typically? Heroin, yeah, heroin's like a big thing, right? And so, and again, I'll, I can go talk about the opioid, uh, the Oxycontin Express a little bit in, in some detail, but um, prescription drug abuse used to be the biggest thing here in Florida because we'd have these like big pill mills where we used to send out tons and tons of oxycodone or hydrocodone. They shut a lot of that down when they kind of got strict on the laws. And so since then, you've been seeing a lot of heroin use going up. And then also, anyone know like a lot of heroin's being laced with nowadays? Fentanyl is a big thing, right? Because again, fentanyl is like super, super potent. You get a lot out of, you know, a kilogram of, of fentanyl goes way farther than a kilogram of, of just heroin by itself does. But anyway, so what happens to some of these patients who are addicted, they go to rehab, right? In rehab, they will um, go off the opioids. Maybe they're using something like buprenorphine or something, and eventually they get clean, so to speak, and their tolerance will go down to almost nothing. Problem is they'll end up getting out and they go back and they use the same dose that they were used to before. What do you think happens? They get, they have way too much of an exaggerated effect, and they typically have that respiratory depression come back and they die. So I actually had a family member, um, uh, actually was in rehab for a period of time, came out, got a dose of heroin, and died from that, right? Because of the fact they lost that tolerance and they don't know that, right? Unless they're educated on that specifically, that can be a big thing that happens there. So, um, I don't know what pseudo addiction means. Pseudo addiction would be kind of like behavior where the patients may seem like you may be kind of getting like your the the hairs on the back of your neck may kind of get raised up a little bit like the patient is they drug seeking but really they're not right and so what happens with some of these patients is they'll be treated for say chronic pain um, and also they start to regain functionality they're getting up they're walking around do, doing more things and that can then exacerbate their pain even worse so maybe they start self-medicating a little bit they run out too soon they come back to you and say hey, I need more medication I ran out um, that may seem like it's inappropriate use or maybe like they have drug-seeking behavior, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that they just are not being appropriately managed for their particular pain anymore, okay? Usually that just requires a dose adjustment and then they should be good to go. But that's another thing to consider is a pseudo-addiction, not necessarily a true addiction in that, that um, regard, right? So anyway, um, so as I mentioned, physical uh, dependence, everyone's going to undergo that, and then anyone can undergo withdrawal. And in fact, um, we actually have... Um, Anyone ever seen uh, like an infant actually undergo withdrawal like this? Happens in the NICU all the time, right? We have uh, parents who or moms who are actually abusing opioids and other drugs throughout pregnancy, and the babies are getting affected by that the whole time, right? They're getting used to that drug being around, and then all of a sudden they're born. What happens to their source? We literally cut it, cut their source, right? Get rid of that umbilical cord, and all of a sudden they're now withdrawing from those medications. It's called neonatal abstinence syndrome. We actually have to manage that. Um, it can be really tough because they can't regulate their temperature very well. They're not feeding well. They're not really gaining weight like they should. Um, so babies can do it. Adults will do it. Anyone can do it, right? This is why tapering is so important. This is why things like buprenorphine are really, really important in terms of, of management for of these withdrawal symptoms. Because um, what happens when patients start withdrawing? They want to go back and get their medications, right? And so that's when they're going to go back and, and that's where you see that kind of that cycle start to occur there. Anyway, um, this is not correlated with addiction. Though. It's kind of one of the big takeaway points there, okay? As I mentioned, addiction is more compulsive use, use despite negative consequences. Um, again, some patients are just wired for this. Some certain reward pathways are just wired to where they're going to respond really well to, to opioids, and that's just their jam, right? And so that's just what they are going to be more prone to getting addic addicted to. Um, 
as I mentioned, some things you're never going to get tolerant to. So for instance, like the constipation, patients are always going to be constipated when they're on opioid. That doesn't really go away, but other things will get uh, better. So for instance, I mentioned um, the opioids make you like nice and peppy and awake. You know, they cause CNS depression, right? But they get tolerant to that, right? So for instance, um, you know, someone who is say getting an opioid for the first time, they probably shouldn't go driving, but if they've been on it for months and years, they probably are at a point where they have gotten so tolerant to it, they can probably drive around and not really be that much of a, a risk from that standpoint. A lot of people, especially on I-4, seem like they have just taken a bunch of opioids. Yeah. A guy the other day that had his right blinker on and went across three lanes of traffic in the left direction. And I'm just like, <laughs> what is happening here? But most deadly highway in the U.S., especially our little stretch of it. But anyway, um, and again, I mentioned that, that pseudo tolerance being it. It looks like it's disease progression. looks like it's addiction, but it's really just changes in pain state, right? It just really is that they just need a dose adjustment in those cases there, okay? Um, not to be confused with addiction, but is there an easy way to tell, is your patient really addicted? Are they drug-seeking? Is there like a magical like stick I can point at them and it tells me if they're addicted or not? No, right? It's, it's very difficult to tell. We'll talk about some ways to try to help delineate between those in a little bit, but um, it's going to be very, really, really difficult here. Um, and again, there's no way to, to determine who's going to become addicted. If they have a history of substance abuse in their family, that could be indicated that they're a higher risk, but it's really difficult to tell in a lot of times there, okay? Anyway, so I'm going to cut it there. We'll talk about e a little bit when we come back and, and addiction and all of that. Is there any questions I can answer before we get into the rest of it tomorrow? Nothing at all. All right, we got we got plenty of slides to go for tomorrow for a four-hour block. We'll do our review as well for the test, and then Monday will be your first farm test, and then you only have three more after that. It'll be done. It'll be great. Um, okay, so is meloxicam a COX-2 selective or not quite? Notice it wasn't on the list. It's more COX-2 selective than something like ibuprofen, but it's not considered like a pure COX-2 inhibitor. It's not in that category like Celebrex is. So if I had a patient with a history of GI issues, um, you know, or maybe they didn't tolerate like ibuprofen very well. Like certainly moxim can be tried. If that's still causing them GI issues, then yeah, go with Celebrex. That's definitely gonna be the, the, the one to go with there. Um, can people grow tolerant to their own chronic pain? Probably, I mean like once I hit 30, things just start hurting and this is like, I guess this is just life now, things are breaking down, but um, not, I guess that's a kind of a difficult question to answer, right? So a lot of it depends on severity, some what's exacerbating it, you know, how well they can function with the pain, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to question the answer there. But um, anything else? If not, enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you all tomorrow.